again, everyone, a uh, good afternoon and welcome to a slightly overcast Trinidad and Tobago from wherever you are. This is MRF HIV SCI Echo, our special 71st uh, session. Uh, I am again Dr. Gregory Boyce, joined uh, with my partner in crime, quote unquote, by Conrad. We have Conrad. And we want to welcome all our friends, old and new, to this uh, special Friday session. And again, we welcome and thank Dr. Chris Behrens from the uh, University of Washington, who is going to do another COVID update. And I think it's, it's, it's a good time for it because with everything we went through, not Omicron coming around and we're hearing more cases and maybe more hospitalizations and things are blistering around. I think we need to just come back to, to, to center regarding what is, is, is this portend? It is, it's, it's not the beginning of the end, it's not the end of the beginning. Where are we and what do we need to know? What do we need to do? particularly uh, in terms of to keep ourselves safe and keep our patients safe. So again, thanks, Dr. Barron, much appreciated as usual, and I turn over to you. Great, thank you very much. As, as always, it's uh, an, an honor and a privilege to be invited to sort of share um, the, whatever insights I can uh, about uh, COVID. So jumping right into it, I have, uh, I just want to acknowledge our sponsors and give credit uh, to them, to those who uh, have made this possible. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Our learning objectives are these for this session. I'm essentially going to review uh, just briefly some epidemiology. I uh, hope you can come away from this with a bit more understanding of these Omicron subvariants and um, how well the vaccinations work, not just the primary series, but also boosters and even a second booster. And then uh, I'm gonna briefly cover um, a medication, an oral medication that has become um, available, at least here in the United States, hopefully will be coming to you soon, that can be used for outpatient treatment of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So to start briefly with epidemiology, uh, this is sort of global epidemiology. There has been a, a gratifying um, uh, downturn in the number of cases worldwide. Uh, although, you know, if you really focus in on that far right end of the graph, it looks like the, we may be uh, plateauing globally. And of course, the experience is very different in different parts of the world. Um, Hong Kong, for example, is experiencing a, you know, a, a, a terrible flare, uh, largely due to the fact that they have been relatively unvaccinated and uh, relatively um, uninfected to date. So things are really out of control in Hong Kong. Um, in terms of other places, perhaps more relevant here in the United States, um, we are seeing a resurgence, uh, the start of what looks like another wave. These are hospitalizations. Again, we are nowhere near the peaks of, you know, the, the uh, past Delta and Omicron waves, but things do seem to be ticking upwards uh, here. Um, and uh, this is also showing cases here in the United States in blue. Uh, South Africa is clearly experiencing uh, a new wave. Um, and these waves that we're seeing starting uh, taking off here in the United States and South Africa are almost certainly due to the introduction of these new variants. And I'm going to revisit these variants in a little more detail uh, shortly. Um, going into the uh, uh, zeroing in more locally on Trinidad and Tobago, these, these are the most recent data I was able to find from World Health Organization, um, which show gratifyingly that, you know, uh, cases are still a lot, you know, lower than what they have been. Deaths are quite low. Uh, but again, it does look like we may be seeing a bit of an uptick uh, in confirmed cases uh, recently. So, Definitely uh, some cause for concern. Um, all right, so let's talk about these variants. Um, the uh, trend we've been seeing all along is that with new variants, we tend to see increasing variant uh, fitness. These new variants tend to be um, better able uh, to reproduce. They cause higher viral loads. They're more infectious to others. 
And such is the case with the Omicron uh, initial version of Omicron, which we call BA.1. And then there have been some subsequent sort of flavors of Omicron, BA.2, three, um, as well as uh, uh, a couple other sublineages um, that appear to be even more infectious than the BA.2 <coughs> um, that is shown here. Uh, so, you know, I, I like the way that this um, physician who's been following this closely and uh, whom I follow for updates, he describes this as, you know, climbing the ladder of SARS-CoV-2 infectivity. And, you know, this is kind of a rough sketch, as it were, but I think it illustrates the point that, you know, we started out with alpha, um, went up to uh, uh, delta, a lot more infectious. From delta you know, to Omicron, um, Omicron or BA.1 was a threefold, 300% increased infectivity as compared with Delta. Um, BA.2 Omicron is another 30% increase in infectivity. Now here in the United States, we are dealing with BA.2.12.1. It sounds like an IP address. Um, I wish we could uh, come up with a better way. <clears throat> of naming these subvariants, and maybe that'll happen. But um, this BA.2.12.1 is another 25% increase in infectivity, and it is spreading uh, here in the United States, accounting for um, over a third of new cases here uh, as of April 30th of this year, so as of just um, about a, a week ago. Um, and here, here you can see over time this trend with the BA.2.12.1 uh, uh, gradually supplanting the BA.2 over time here in the United States. And um, this, again, is what's probably driving the uh, gradual uptick in cases here in the United States. Um, obviously, it's hard to know just how severe a wave we're going to have as a consequence of this. It's early days. It doesn't seem to be a really severe, uh, steep um, uh, ascent so far. So fingers crossed uh, on that point. Uh, South Africa uh, is experiencing a new wave due to a different uh, combination or couple of subvariants, I should say, BA.4 and BA.5, which evolved independently of the 2.12.1. Um, and <clears throat> BA.4 and .5, uh, they sh share some of the same um, uh, mutations, especially in the spike protein as 2.12.2, uh, or dot .1, I should say. And we know it's more infectious than BA.2, not quite as much as one that's starting to hit the United States, uh, but it has a lot of other similarities to, um, uh, to these other subvariants. Um, and down below, I have shown a graph showing all the sort of key uh, mutation uh, amongst these different subvariants of Omicron for those who are sort of interested in uh, really looking in detail at the differences uh, among them. So we are seeing continued evolution uh, and variants develop out of the Omicron uh, lineage. Uh, that are, you know, to continue the trend associated with uh, increased infectivity and increased uh, transmission rates. Um, this table tries to kind of summarize uh, in one place uh, what we know about these different Omicron subvariants so far. And uh, we're looking at BA.1, um, BA.2, BA.12.1. Or 2.12.1, and then the BA.4 and .5. Um, and so again, I think the key point is the transmissibility is increased for uh, all, all four of these new sort of sub lineages as compared to BA.1. Um, they seem to have um, varying degrees of improved escape from the immune system, um, ability to infect cells. Um, variable cross immunity with BA.1, but I think the key here is that, you know, if you were infected with Omicron, uh, the original version of it, it's it not necessarily gonna give you a whole lot of protection against 
uh, these uh, newer strains that are that are coming out. Um, BA.2 is you know fairly widespread uh, in over 100 countries. The BA.2.12.1 taking over the United States, dot four and dot five, South Africa. Really unclear at this point, you know, um, which one is going to go where uh, in the world. Um, but I would expect a very high risk of, you know, both of these variants sort of um, going out of their host regions, given how much air travel we're seeing, given how, um, you know, how much we're getting relaxed around uh, masking, for example, uh, on flights, you know, within and to the United States, uh, masking is no longer required uh, on the flights, which seems like kind of a foolish decision to me, but they didn't ask me. Um, and at the bottom, we have some data uh, from, mostly from the United Kingdom about the efficacy of vaccines against uh, hospitalization, whether two shots versus uh, three shots. Again, mostly United Kingdom data. Uh, we only have those for BA1 and BA.2. We don't have those data yet really for the 2.12.1 or the BA.4 and .5 too early. But gratifyingly, we do see that the vaccines still seem to be working pretty well, at least against the you know, more severe outcomes of hospitalization with both the two shot um, uh, series, not uh, nearly as strong as getting a third shot, a, a booster shot. So um, uh, to move on, I think that's a good segue to talk about the effectiveness of vaccination. Um, and uh, we've gotten, I'm gonna review some data from various places. Uh, first of all, United Kingdom, as I just showed, um, the you know the trend we've seen is that against Omicron, the two shot series um, is just not as effective uh, as it was against uh, prior versions. And but furthermore, getting a third shot, a booster shot, really does make a meaningful difference, at least with respect to guarding against hospitalization, as shown here. Um, and the United Kingdom is not the only place that we have uh, to uh, you know, give us these data. Um, these are data that were uh, just published uh, two days ago in the New England Journal. Um, South Africa reported how well um, the uh, Pfizer vaccine worked and how well the Johnson & Johnson, a Jan a Janssen vaccine worked uh, against various outcomes well, the more severe outcomes, I should say, hospital admission uh, or um, you know higher level care, ICU level care uh, for these uh, vaccines. And here it's graphed according to days out from uh, when the uh, vaccine was uh, re received. So uh, again, we see across the board, um, and you can see a couple of trends. Uh, you, you see that um, fortunately both of these vaccines looked um, really quite effective um, uh, in preventing hospital admission um, and or uh, ICU care. Uh, now we have longer follow-up for the uh, Pfizer vaccine, that's the BNT162B2 in blue, and we show uh, gratifyingly again a sustained protection at least with regard to that metric of uh, hospitalization or uh, ICU care, extending out to over five months. Again, that's the BA.1 Omicron surge, uh, mostly from late last year uh, in South Africa. Um, Israel uh, has uh, also started publishing uh, a lot of data. Israel you know, has really been vaccinated on, vaccinating almost the entire country. Um, they've been almost exclusively using the Pfizer vaccine, and they've been uh, monitoring uh, outcomes very closely, which is why so much of our data regarding the effectiveness of that particular uh, vaccine comes uh, from Israel. This was a observational study during their fifth wave. It was an Omicron dominant wave initially, uh, BA.1, but then they got some uh, BA.2 dominating later on. 
Um, and this analysis included all those who were 60 years of age or older, who had received their second dose at least four months before the end of the study, not infected by uh, SARS-CoV-2 before the study period, and hadn't been vaccinated with a different vaccine before the study period. And they looked at the rates of severe disease in nine different cohorts, um, including those who had only received um, uh, a second dose, or you know, those who had only completed the initial series, as compared with you know people who had received a third dose or a booster dose of this vaccine at various time points following receipt of it, and then they even had uh, data regarding a fourth dose because in Israel they have recommended that all those uh, 60 years of age or older and having certain risk factors. Uh, receive actually a fourth dose of the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Um, and that uh, rightmost column, I think, it gives you the relevant uh, findings here um, with the adjusted rate of severe disease uh, per 100,000 person days at risk. And so um, uh, the, the rate of 11.6 uh, for having received just completing the primary series uh, is significantly reduced in people who receive a booster shot, a third dose. And you see uh, sort of going down that column on the right, looking at the uh, <clears throat> rates, there is consistently a significantly reduced risk of uh, severe disease as compared with those who had just re simply received the you know, completion of the primary series. And that's sustained over time. Um, moreover, having received a fourth dose, uh, at least initially, uh, another, you know, even more dramatic decline, uh, cutting the risk about one-tenth as compared to those who had received just the primary series. So we'll have, we'll see more data from Israel um, coming up, but I think that's encouraging data about, you know, in the presence of BA1 and BA2, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, adding a third dose confer significant protection against severe disease, a fourth dose, perhaps even more. Uh, this is the same study, just kind of showing uh, uh, those the, the same figures in a graphical way that I think really helps illustrate just how much the risk of severe disease is reduced after getting a third dose, how that um, risk reduction is sustained, and how a fourth dose, at least early early on seems to confer additional protection. Um, okay, now we have a lot of data from uh, the United States as well. Um, this, uh, there are a lot of slides in here that summarize um, uh, various studies done in the United States and which were uh, basically presented about a month ago uh, by the CDC. Now there's, there's a lot of data in here and we don't have time to go through it all. So I'm going to, you know, retain the slides and the copy that will be available um, uh, for circulation, everybody. But in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead to sort of these uh, a summary area. And if there's time at the end, we can always go back and look at these in more more detail. But just to try and summarize the stuff I've um, covered so far, uh, this slide is looking at the effectiveness of two doses of a messenger RNA-based vaccine in the context of the Omicron, uh, you know, primarily BA.1 uh, <clears throat> variant in the United States. Um, and it's looking at various, um, you know, outcomes or complications of SARS-CoV-2 infection in uh, basically children and adolescents. And so the, the, the top uh, section of <clears throat> this uh, graph is showing how well the two doses of mRNA-based vaccines protect against uh, infection um, in this age group. And uh, there are various studies looking at that, the ICAT, the PROTECT study. Uh, and there is sort of a consistent finding, I think, here that there is, um, the vaccines are maybe roughly um, 25 to 50% effective in preventing uh, infection. So not, not hugely effective, but still, you know, that's something. Uh, if we look, however, at, I guess, more relevant clinical outcomes, let's say 
whether or not these children and adolescents need to be seen in the emergency room or urgent care, uh, we find a pattern of perhaps increased uh, effectiveness, um, uh, more like at least 50% effectiveness in uh, two of those studies. Um, and if we look at the most um, severe outcome, including those you know, requiring hospitalization in this age group, we see um, you know, a range of outcomes in these various studies, but nevertheless, overall, you know, um, uh, I think we're seeing evidence of more effectiveness of those vaccines, with a couple of these studies finding over 90% efficacy in um, just a two-dose series preventing um, hospitalization. So there's sort of a trend here, um, in that you know these the the, M M the messenger RNA vaccines are uh, increasingly effective when you start looking at increasingly severe uh, outcomes, and that's kind of a trend we've been seeing in uh, adults uh, as well. So this is um, a slide looking at adults greater than 18 years of age, um, and we see kind of a similar pattern looking at just infection, uh, two doses doesn't have a whole lot of impact in prevention. It's not zero, but you know, it's less, less than 40% probably. Uh, <clears throat> if however, a third dose is given, and this is something that's different about this summary slide, it looks at the uh, efficacy of a booster dose, that seems to dramatically increase the effectiveness of vaccination in preventing um, just infection. Uh, if we look at a more uh, cl clinically relevant outcome of needing to seek emergency department or urgent care, uh, again, we see the same sort of pattern. Um, a two-dose series is more effective in preventing that outcome than uh, infection. Um, and a three-dose series adds even more protection. Same pattern when we look at hospitalization, or critical illness or death. And here the confidence intervals, I think are a little tighter than they were in the last slide and a little more uniform because frankly, we have more data about um, adults than we do about children. Um, bottom line, uh, a two dose series provides at least 50% protection, I would say against hospitalization, but adding that third dose really bumps up the efficacy and kind of the same pattern for critical illness uh, and death with a third dose of the messenger RNA vaccination going, uh, really having a very high level of efficacy in preventing critical illness uh, or, or death. Um, so if we can uh, try to summarize in kind of one slide looking at um, children, adolescents and adults, and then looking at the efficacy of two or three doses in terms of protection against either simply infection versus needing uh, emergency department care versus needing hospitalization. Um, you know, I, I think we see this, this clear trend. Um, a two-dose series limited protection against just uh, against getting infected uh, across the board, all age groups, but higher protection against um, needing emergency room care and even higher than that protection against hospitalization. Now I didn't really show the data in these summary slides that are buried in the slides I skipped, but there is evidence, however, that there is some waning of that protection over time on the order of four to five months after completing, you know, a, um, the uh, uh, initial series. And that's why a third dose, a booster shot, uh, seems to have a real impact. Now we don't have enough data yet on children or adolescents, but we do see in adults that that booster shot does provide substantial additional protections for all outcomes. Um, there is some data to support that, that of those effects also wane a bit with time. Um, which is why uh, Israel uh, actually decided to go ahead and recommend its um, fourth booster vaccination. Um, but before going on to, to those uh, data regarding a, a second booster or a fourth shot, 
Um, there's just a few other uh, more recent studies uh, supporting the efficacy of a, a booster shot. This is something that was just published um, this morning, looking at data from skilled nursing home facilities in the United States, very large pool of panel. Uh, and this is just looking at crude you know, rates of um, <clears throat> infection uh, among uh, skilled nursing facility residents. And um, you know, in all the groups, the trends are going down. And that reflects the larger epidemiologic pattern of SARS-CoV-2 infection in, in the United States, at least through you know, mid-March. But what's relevant here is that um, uh, getting that additional or booster dose for nursing home residents does provide significant additional protection against getting uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2. So um, uh, sort of a plug for treating those most vulnerable with uh, a booster shot. Uh, there are national data from Germany um, that basically show the same data. I'm not gonna uh, go through all these uh, tables and columns, but it's kind of a similar uh, kind of analysis looking at symptomatic infection versus hospitalization versus severe illness. There's a clear pattern that um, uh, getting a uh, booster shot um, really does provide protection against getting um, uh, any of these outcomes. Okay, now what about that second booster vaccination, getting a fourth dose? So this is where uh, we really are relying on, to, so far, the, the experience of Israel. Because Israel, as I mentioned, based on data they had from their third shot of a booster series of the uh, Pfizer vaccination, decided to go ahead and recommend vaccination for individuals at risk, primarily those over 60 years of age, with a second booster shot, a fourth Pfizer vaccination. Um, so this is one of these uh, studies um, uh, published very recently in which um, they extracted data from over a million persons, 60 years of age or older, um, uh, in Israel during the Omicron variant uh, period. And they estimate rates of confirmed infection and severe COVID-19 um, as a function of time starting eight days after receipt of a fourth dose as compared with infection and severe illness among persons who had received only three dose. Um, and uh, this is kind of a busy table, but I think the key point to look here is this adjusted rate ratio in which they look at the uh, protection uh, against uh, infection in this table after receiving the fourth dose. And the, the rate ratio here, it's, it's um, uh, for sort of technical reasons, it's uh, a little bit inverted in a sense. This is not a hazard ratio of getting uh, the illness. It's more like the, the rate ratio corresponds to protection against uh, getting infection, okay? So you want um, in this box, you want to see higher numbers rather than lower numbers. Um, and so what you see broadly speaking is that after getting that fourth dose, you do see an increased level of protection um, among the individuals who receive the fourth dose. Um, and that protection, at least from the data we see, seems to be highest you know, in weeks three, four, five, but then it seems to taper off actually by week eight. So uh, the booster dose in terms of preventing um, just infection uh, with COVID, um, kind of fleeting, you know, it, it does provide uh, benefit, but it doesn't seem to last. Um, however, when it comes to preventing severe illness, the booster dose performs much better. And you see um, uh, improved protection from severe illness uh, in people who have received a fourth shot of the Pfizer vaccine that uh, is uh, that starts very soon after getting the vaccine and is sustained. It even seems uh, to uh, increase over time, although you know the confidence intervals get uh, a little bit wider uh, over time. 
So that's encouraging. This is kind of a graph, uh, an, another way of showing the same data. When we just look at infection in blue, um, slight benefits that seems to taper off over time. But when it comes to severe illness, uh, a more meaningful level of protection that is sustained at least over the you know, six weeks uh, follow-up uh, in that particular study. So encouraging data uh, from that study. Um, but of course, this is not the only um, data we have uh, from Israel. Here's another study that was kind of looking at the same question, but uh, these were drawn rather than from national data, these were drawn from a healthcare organization in Israel. Um, from January, uh, early January to mid-February of this year. So slightly more recent time period. Um, and again, evaluating effectiveness of a fourth vaccine dose as compared with that of a third dose, uh, given at least four months earlier among persons 60 years of age uh, or older. And uh, this time they're, they're sort of matching the individuals uh, from these two groups. Um, uh, they're matching individuals who had a fourth dose with people who had not. Um, so it's a slightly different methods and they're looking at various outcomes for uh, COVID uh, illness, starting from seven, uh, lasting through 30 days following the receipt of that fourth dose. So, um, and this kind of summarizes all those uh, results. Um, the fourth dose, when it comes to just, um, uh, you know, asymptomatic infection, um, not quite, didn't quite even reach 50%, but still additional benefit in preventing uh, infection. In terms of preventing symptomatic COVID-19, well, looks like about a 50%, slightly higher uh, rate of prevention there. Preventing hospitalization, uh, more effective, 68% reduction, severe COVID illness, about the same. COVID-19 related death reduced the risk by about 74%. So at least going out to 30 days, which granted is not a very long follow-up period, but going out to one month after having received that fourth dose, we do see significant protection afforded by uh, a fourth dose against the most clinically relevant uh, outcomes, severe illness, hospitalization, uh, and death. Obviously, we need more ongoing data to see if this is uh, sustained over time. Um, there was another study, a smaller one, looking at how well it worked in terms of preventing infection among healthcare workers. Um, and this was an open label, non randomized clinical study. Um, and uh, again, they, they used matched controls uh, <clears throat> for people who did not receive a fourth dose. Uh, and what they found was that a fourth dose, um, according to these Kaplan-Meier graphs, seemed to reduce the risk um, uh, in terms of um, uh, acquiring infection, not by a whole lot. The, the, you know, the sort of confidence intervals overlap, but still there may be some benefit here. The one interesting thing about this study is it, um, not only did they look at individuals who received the Pfizer vaccine on the left in blue, but they also had some individuals receiving um, the Moderna vaccine on the right, which is a similar um, messenger RNA based uh, vaccine, um, but not identical. And we, we have seen some differences in those two vaccines. Numbers are smaller for the Moderna vaccine um, but kind of a similar pattern of, yeah, there might be some benefit there, uh, uh, especially with the Pfizer one. Okay, um, I'm going to shift gears now and talk about um, an option for treatment of outpatient basis of SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, involving a medication that uh, has come out relatively recently and is becoming increasingly available, at least here in the United States. I don't know um, if it's become available in uh, the Caribbean region yet. Um, uh, hopefully we can talk about that a little bit more uh, shortly. Uh, but I think 
you know, if it's not there yet, it's likely to be coming your way. And so I think it's uh, good to know about, you know, what is this medication? How do we use it? How effective is it? It's called uh, Nirmatrovir um, or Paxlovid is the brand name. Um, and the best evidence, you know, we have, the reason it's been FDA approved and is now being used here in the United States is uh, this uh, clinical trial, which was just released um, last month. This was an international phase two to three, a high quality study. It was a double blind randomized controlled trial, uh, looking at how well does this medication, near, near matrovir, um, work in terms of preventing uh, disease progression of COVID in individuals that have been diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 infection, who are symptomatic with it, um, and who uh, had very recent onset of symptoms. So in this study, basically individuals who had confirmed COVID and were symptomatic from it, but not sick enough to need to be hospitalized, right? Uh, but who had risk factors for potentially needing to be uh, hospitalized. So think of you know, this being, um, uh, a study group for the basis of this trial who had COVID, recent onset of symptoms, and were at risk of disease progression. And so you're trying to interrupt the illness in order to keep them out of the hospital. Participants in this trial were randomized to either the study medication, which is this nirmatrovir, uh, with ritonavir for boosting, uh, we're, <laughs> we're familiar with that idea, right? Um, uh, whereas um, the control arm, of course, was placebo, and it was a one-to-one -one, um, active drug versus placebo arm. And uh, these, the trial enrolled over 2,000 adults, again, randomly assigned to one of these two arms. They took the medication um, uh, twice a day, for five days, uh, they had to be on it within, um, started within five days after the onset of symptoms. Uh, the primary outcome of their final analysis, uh, which involved uh, about 1,400 patients, was how well did this reduce the risk or rate of hospitalization or death from any cause uh, within 28 days? Um, and the primary analysis uh, included patients who were started within three days after symptom onset, but they also looked at those who started within, you know, a more generous period, five days. So um, uh, this, this essentially is the results when it comes to COVID-19 related hospitalization or any cause of death in the, uh, you know, active medication arm, the mer mer uh, nirmatrovir group, five hospitalizations, no deaths. And that compared with 44 hospitalizations and nine deaths in the uh, individuals randomized to the placebo group. That's a pretty uh, significant uh, difference. In fact, it translates to an 89% relative risk reduction enjoyed by those who uh, had been randomized to receive near natural fear. Um, and that's fairly impressive clearly uh, statistically significant. Um, and when they expanded to look at a secondary outcome of, well, what about patients who started within five days after symptom onset rather than just three? Uh, they saw essentially the same phenomenon, 88% um, relative risk uh, reduction um, with a sort of broader uh, group in that respect. So, that is um, essentially why uh, it is currently prescribed in this fashion that if um, uh, an individual is diagnosed with symptomatic COVID, not sick enough to be hospitalized, but has risk factors for becoming uh, for disease progression, and we can catch them within five days, it is uh, recommended to prescribe them this uh, medication. Um, this is another way of looking at those same data with a sort of Kaplan-Meier graph showing the difference uh, over time, which really was uh, sustained over the full course of the 28 days of uh, follow-up. Um, and uh, when they broke it down by different subgroups, they really 
didn't see you know much of a difference here. Um, gender, uh, it, it may have been more effective uh, in those under 65 as compared to over 65. Um, however, you know the numbers were small for those over 65 wide confidence intervals. Uh, I wouldn't read necessarily too much into that. Um, uh, and so, you know, bottom line, it seemed to work across different age groups, different BMIs, whether or not they had diabetes, different genders, um, uh, time since symptom onset, even looking at those who, you know, less than three days versus more than three days, really uh, no difference. So encouraging, you know, subset analysis, I would say. In terms of side effects, there are some side effects. They were not very common. common. Um, uh, taste abnormalities, um, ironically, were more common in the uh, treatment group, you know, presumably side effect of this medication. Diarrhea also um, uh, more common than in the placebo group. Um, I could easily chalk that up to the ritonavir that's there for the boosting. Uh, but again, these were not very high percentages uh, either. So overall, fairly well tolerated. Um, and interestingly, they, they looked at, you know, did this make much of a difference in terms of dropping the, the uh, viral load of COVID? Did, you know, Paxlovid does interfere uh, with, you know, the, the life cycle. And they weren't, weren't really able to show that um, uh, in, this, in this study. The drop in viral load over time was pretty much the same uh, in, in both groups. But nevertheless, uh, the outcome that really matters uh, it did improve clinical outcomes. Um, since then, since that study came out, there was another study that was published that asked the question, well, could we use this as um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, so to speak, against COVID? You know, what if you've got a small outbreak in a nursing facility, for example, can we give Paxlovid uh, to try and uh, prevent this infection similar to the way we might use um, uh, uh, Tamiflu or Ocel Tamivir to prevent influenza outbreaks in a similar setting. Uh, it did not work, uh, unfortunately, uh, in that setting. So we, we don't have any indication to consider using it at that point. Um, uh, <clears throat> but it does clearly work in terms of preventing disease progression among those who have been diagnosed with COVID and have risk factors. So I'll, I'm going to stop there and give us a good 15 minutes or so um, to uh, answer questions and sort of discuss uh, any clarification you might want. And what, what are the implications for the Caribbean? I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks again for, for the presentation. Excellent as usual. I will open the floor of anyone uh, who wants to ask a question rather than, uh, than how many questions for myself. I know I have a few, but I'll let everyone jump in first. Okay, good afternoon again. I, I, I'm just wondering, for some of us who are, who are vaccinated, who got, let's say, AstraZeneca vaccine almost over a year ago, and then got one dose of Pfizer vaccine, who are such people safe from Omicron, especially the new variants? Sure, good question. And, you know, we, we, we have our, our data regarding like, you know, the AstraZeneca efficacy and, um, uh, you know, against these new variants is um, much more limited, uh, frankly, because, um, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine fell a little bit out of favor and um, there, there was sort of a shift, I think, to more and more use of the messenger RNA vaccines uh, and reasonably so because I think there was enough evidence to support that those vaccines were more effective and uh, safer. Um, my take is, you know, just trying to sort of read the tea leaves across all the various studies and what we've seen so far with uh, other you know, variants to date, uh, we have clearly seen a trend of the messenger RNA vaccines working better than the uh, AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, and so I would say, 
you you want to get um, you know you, you want to get a, a second shot at least a second shot and I would recommend a third shot a booster so to speak um, of a messenger RNA based vaccine um, how well are you protected against these new variants um, uh, having received you know in your specific situation a AstraZeneca and then a Pfizer um, very hard to you know pin an estimate on that, but I wouldn't I wouldn't count on being protected. That's for sure. And of course, it depends. The answer to that question depends on well, how long has it been since you got your last Pfizer? Because we know that efficacy tends to wane over time. Um, you know, uh, most of the studies suggest four to five months. We start to see some waning over time. Um, and also protection in what sense? Um, we know that, you know, thankfully uh, there, there is definitely some protection maintained uh, over time against the most severe outcomes. Uh, but even then, uh, we have also clearly seen evidence that a booster shot improves your protection against those severe outcomes. So I think sort of any way you slice it, you know, um, if it's been, you know, at least, uh, you know, four months or more since your last Pfizer vaccination, I think you would be more protected against um, any of these possible outcomes of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection if you got a booster um, a shot, a third, a third shot, and I would recommend that third shot be a messenger RNA-based vaccine. It doesn't have to be Pfizer. It absolutely could be Moderna, and there have in fact been some interesting uh, data suggesting maybe it's better to mix and match, at least with the uh, messenger RNA-based vaccines. You might get a little bit of a broader, um, uh, a more broad-based uh, <clears throat> protection uh, with that strategy. Does that, I hope that um, answers Yes, 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 yes. It, it does answer quite comprehensively, <laughs> thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in just a little bit. Hi, Dr. Barons. Sure. Good question. I remember one of the touted um, advantages of the mRNA vaccine was the potential speed with which um, the vaccine can be modified should to, to accommodate some of the new variants and some of the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the immunologic escape that the variants were, were undergoing. Is there any plan with the Omicron variant, given that it's one so prevalent, and, and um, in the sense that there's still some sort of antigenic similarity between some of the, the subvariants in Omicron? And is there any, was there any plan? Have you heard anything about trying to develop a, a, a a booster to the mRNA type vaccination that would come for those to maybe offer some improved um, uh, prevention of acquisition of an infection. Right, very good question. And yes, that you, you are correct. That is a, um, a, very, a very real potential advantage of these messenger RNA vaccines um, uh, that it in theory should be a bit easier to you know, update, um, you, you simply generate a, diff, a slightly different mRNA strand for the vaccine based on matching it with the most recent variants that are come out um, to better match the spike protein, et cetera. Um, and I, I recall seeing um, uh, that um, Moderna is working on this. Um, and in fact, they, um, they, they are working on uh, a vaccine that is intended to better protect against some of these subvariants. Um, and it's expected to release results, uh, some early results later this month or early June. Um, so we're kind of waiting on that. Um, and I think it's likely we are gonna start to see maybe, you know, 
updated versions, boosters, et cetera, that are perhaps more tailored uh, to variants. What's, um, what's kind of crazy is how quickly some of these new variants seem to be evolving, And right? And so and by the time, even though it is faster, right, with the messenger RNA technology, will they come out in time or by the time they come out, will they be obsolete, you know, sort of like our our printed HIV guidelines, right? By the time we actually get them printed and out, they're sometimes uh, already obsolete. Um, so I would say stay tuned. It's definitely happening, happening. At least Moderna is working on it. And I think we'll see some data about that uh, in the next uh, month or two. Take another course. Um, Chris, I read somewhere, Jeffrey Edwards, I read somewhere that um, the medication pa Paxlovid, mm -hmm. uh, once you complete the course, uh, some people tend to get a little rebound after they, they, they stop the five-day course. I don't know. Yeah. You heard that at all? Uh, I have not, um, but that's interesting. And uh, you could, I mean, it's only five days and often the illness itself lasts longer. So I I, I could absolutely see how, you know, well, maybe Paxlovid is kind of knocking it down while you're taking it, but then you relieve it and then it, it might come back a bit. It's sort of <laughs> almost like stopping a steroid taper too soon and the setting of an asthma flare, or, right? Um, so uh, I, I think that's very possible what you mentioned. I, I hadn't heard it, but I don't doubt it. And maybe, who knows, maybe with further study, we may end up uh, settling on a longer course of treatment rather than just five days. We may eventually decide that it should be, you know, uh, longer than that, or um, maybe adjust the length of treatment depending on the, the underlying risk factor severity. And in terms of the... Um the boosters, it seems like every four to six months, we probably need another booster. In Trinidad, those people took the two doses and they say, that's it. They took the two doses, that's it, they're good. But I mean, from the data is showing, it seems like immunity is way, uh, waning. So we may probably need mm -hmm. a booster every like six months or so. Yeah, I, absolutely. That is that is one of the key messages I was trying to, uh, to uh, uh, drive home. Um, so like this is one of those, you know, summary slides from various studies done in, in the U.S. Um, three doses is, you know, significantly, adds significantly more protection than does just two doses. And we're talking about really relevant clinical outcomes, you know, hospitalization and, and critical illness and, and death. Right? It doesn't get much more clinically relevant than that. So um, I given, you know, given the very strong, frankly, safety profile of these mRNA vaccines, um, given that we know that the efficacy of a two-dose series clearly wanes over time, and given that we know adding that booster dose significantly ramps up the protection, uh, including against the most severe outcomes. Um, to me, there's, you know, it, there's just no reason I can think of to not do it unless you have had a really bad reaction to the initial series, um, right? So I'm a big fan of getting, you know, boosters. Um, we didn't really touch on uh, long COVID, but um, that's perhaps a topic for you know a future session, but there's increasing and legitimate concern, I think, about what's called long COVID, people who's, um, who have persistent um, symptoms of COVID or other problems after infection. That, uh, uh, and it seems to be a pretty substantial percentage of the individuals who have had the illness. And so, um, you know, bottom line is I, I really don't want to get this illness. Uh, I, I don't for multiple reasons. And uh, the 
potential for getting this uh, long COVID, which we really don't know what to do about it at this point, uh, only adds to that concern. So my take is, um, you know, I want to get every booster as soon as I can, as soon as it comes out, um, assuming we, we, I can see any evidence of it providing some protection. And that is the pattern we've been seeing consistently uh, so far. Chris, also in our HIV patients, um, we've noted that in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, it may be actually slightly lower than in the general population. I mean, we haven't seen a lot of hospitalizations and deaths in our HIV patients. Some of them who are not even vaccinated. Any data on you know, patients with HIV out there? Uh, the data we have on people with HIV seems to, you know, the, the, the overall trend seems to be um, if they're on treatment and viral load undetectable, CD4 count, you know, over 100, over 200, uh, they're, they're, their outcomes are pretty similar to anyone else. There doesn't seem to be a discernible difference in complication rates, severity, et cetera. Um, However, those who have end-stage HIV disease or, or uh, you know, not on treatment, high viral loads, low CD4 counts, they generally do have worse outcomes. It, it definitely is a risk factor for a more severe course of illness and a higher risk of, of death. That's the general pattern. Um, I have not seen anything to, to suggest that individuals with HIV uh, in any way have better outcomes. So that's interesting that, you know, you were, you uh, seem to be seeing that in, in, in Trinidad. So um, that, that, you know, I, I, all I can say is I, I have not seen that sort of published anywhere. Um, but I, I'd be curious if that's, you know, really holds up what, what might be going on there. Yeah, we have to look at the data. So, I mean, we have some data and all this. So we'll probably look at, and probably do an abstract on it and see if it's really, you know, tease it out and see if mm -hmm. what, we, what the data shows. But again, as I said, most of our patients are virally suppressed. Eh? So as I say, uh, they'll probably have um, no difference from the general population. Mm -hmm. Hi, one of, one of the problems that uh, I thought to be associated with the long-term complications after COVID infection is the formation of microplots. Mm -hmm. Is there any difference between microplots formation amongst people with Omicron infection and those who had Delta? Um, yeah, good question. I And short answer is I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody knows the, the answer to that question. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, I'd have to do basically a, a literature search to see if anybody's tried to study that. How much does uh, Pax, Paxlovid cost in the US? I was just checking online and it seems to be about $530 per course. That's for five days. So, a bit, yeah. a bit expensive. Right. Um, so the expense of medications in the United States is always sort of hard to figure out because, uh, you know, the key question is whether or not it's covered by insurance. If it is, the patient isn't paying anything, um, whereas the insurance company has probably got to deal with the manufacturer. Uh, if it's not, there may be you know, special coupons or deals. I, I, I like to think that, you know, the cost of medications that you see listed, the sticker price, um, almost nobody ends up actually paying that, right? It's, it's almost like um, the sticker price for uh, a used car, right? It's, <laughs> it, there's often haggling, there's, there's other things come into play. So, I, I'm sure the manufacturer is definitely, you know, charging insurance companies and plans and um, trying to, uh, you know, recoup the costs of the research that went into it and, you know, get, make as much profit as, as they can off of it. Um, but 
it, you know, what you see listed as the price for it here in the United States uh, is not necessarily going to be at all relevant to what it might cost, let's say, if it's licensed to a generic company for use in other countries. And, I'm, and I know there are efforts underway to do that. Um, I, and so that raises a question for me. Do you, uh, I really don't know what the situation is with this medication for use in the Caribbean. Does anybody have any insight into whether or not it might become an option? Had to say, yeah, it's I see some files of drugs, I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, no. the interesting thing about it is, of course, the ritonavir. Um, and so one has to account for drug drug interactions, but of course, we're all we're all used to that, <laughs> and it you know, um, it, you can continue ritonavir based ART, you just might have to. Uh, modify the, the boosting, so to speak. All right. I thank you again, Dr. Behrens, for that, that great presentation. Really, you know, good participation offers really, really excellent questions. I just want to encourage anyone, if you've got a particularly burning question that you wanted to, uh, to, to pull during session, um, but you weren't able to, or felt a little shy, uh, send us an email. We are in the WhatsApp group as well. And we can forward this to Dr. Barron's because I, I, I have about four questions written down that uh, I'd be forward as well. Um, so again, uh, it's, it's a wonderful Friday afternoon, uh, weekend coming up. Um, everyone get rested, get, get, get recharged. Again, thanks to everyone. We shall see you back in two weeks' time. So uh, on Thursday, back on regular schedule. And it, that's it from us at MRF HIV. Echo, stay well and stay blessed and get vaccinated. Take care, everybody. Thank you. God bless you all. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, you.